tips. We call it first world problems. You know, when your phone doesn't bring up what you're looking for in like a split second, you're, you know, you, you're just ticked off. It ruins your day. Yeah. Um, and now these folks are being challenged. Life is challenging them and, and it's tough, but I'm hoping that what it does is bring common sense back to America. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Um, you, you know, I noticed that you're a very public sheriff and I appreciate that. It's how I found you, but that comes at a cost. And I'm wondering at what point did you decide, Hey, I really need to have my voice out on social media and do more marketing of what I'm saying and what's important to me. You mentioned you were, you had a marketing company. Maybe that's where the two came together, but, um, that's pretty bold to put yourself out there at the level you are. Yeah, and I don't mean to, to to give you a longer answer than what you're looking for, but set out to brand our agency. We knew it was going to be hard to hire, and we had the foresight to know that we needed to brand ourselves and show law enforcement guys that we they can they can come work for us and believe that we're going to stand behind them and stand in front of them and do and protect them. We did that on purpose. We also wanted to share a message that police do good work every day. I think a lot of agencies that really struggled during 2020 when the uh, what happened in Minnesota, those agencies had not developed a relationship with their community. They had failed to brand their agencies. And as a law, as a profession, we have failed to brand our profession. And so I have worked our purpose to brand our agency and to brand the leadership here that we, we want you to come work for us. And we want our people to know that we are going to protect them. Now, as far as it relates to the challenges now and standing in the, the gap now, for me, it's actually become easier mm. because the line in the sand is so distinct. You are trying to take away freedom. You are trying to, to eliminate God out of our country. You are trying to do things that I have a very strong um, personal values against those things. I want against you taking those things away. I want to maintain freedom. I want to believe in God the way I want to believe in it. I believe in the family unity. I believe in the rule of law. And so really it's been easier for me. The pressure is hard because people hate you for it, but I'm so solid in the fact that I feel so confident and so um, um, I feel confident in the fact that I'm doing what's right. And I'm doing what's best for my people. And, and I know that people are going to disagree with that and hate me for it. And tr trust me, they come after you with pitchforks and knives. they are ready. They're hunting for bear if you stand against them. Um, but these folks are bullies and, and uh, you know, it's now's not the time to cower in the corner. Yeah. You know, in, in 1986, when I graduated yeah. high school, I wanted to become a sheriff. My dad said, it's not what it used to be. I don't, I advise you not to do it, but I'll tell you, listening to you and watching you at 54 years of age, I'll come down there and work for you, man. You guys, it looks like you're doing a phenomenal job uh, for your County. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, there is no age limit, so you're welcome to come on down. <laughs> well, they're going to have to kick me out of Montana first. Uh, you know, I saw you uh, yesterday, you posted, you had a John McCain moment. Uh, you know, you were in there in a public forum and you called out that gentleman. Um, we need more of that boldness. You know, uh, what's your advice to others as it relates to how you're presenting yourself? You know, those guys get up and they usually beat me up every week. And, you know, I, one thing is I've learned to just, just ignore it. They're the only people in there wearing masks. Uh, they're like four or five Democrats. And look, I'm not disparaging the party, the Democrat party, but these folks get up there every day. They still talk about Donald Trump. They still talk about everything. Well, talking about me is one thing, but then when the guy, when another citizen comes in and shares an, a, a differing opinion in you, and get all them a crackpot. What that does is that that's going to send a message to other citizens to not come and to not speak what they want to speak. And so I wanted to get up there and, and stand for that guy. That's my job. My job is to protect the people against the bullies. And so I, I wasn't planning on saying anything until that guy said that. Mm. And then the guy before him was, was trying to rebuke one of our supervisors for not taking his John McCain moment when people were chanting, let's go Brandon. And, and an event. 
And so I, I took those two things and I combined them into one. And I said, you know, look, I'm going to take this John McCain moment to shame on you. You should apologize to this guy for calling him a crackpot. You guys preach tolerance, but then you come up here and you call people names. And then, you know, you were all too accepting of the F Donald Trump for the last four years. Um, but you're, you're offended by let's go. Go Brandon. I mean, and so I just kind of went off a little bit. I tried to keep it short. I didn't want to take up people's time. It's a board meeting, but it was something that I just felt moved to do yesterday. And I agree. We need bold people right now. If not, the evil will be, will, uh, will be pervasive. Mm -hmm. It's that old Edmund Burr quote for evil to prevail. All it need, all we need is for good men to do nothing. Yeah. Speaking of which, I just heard an interview with Sheriff Leo sure. Dutton up here. I believe he's the, the chairman of the Western Sheriff's Association. He was talking about uh, fentanyl and the drug crisis and the border. And what's interesting is I don't even know what you watch for the news, so you can, you can tell us where you get your news from. But, you know, I don't watch any news anymore, so I try to find good sources. Tell us how bad is the fentanyl problem and how bad is the border currently? So I don't don't watch the news either. And if you watch my social media, you'll see that I did another post yesterday about fentanyl. And I kind of equated it. And I, I know people are going to get uh, uneasy. They're going to feel uneasy and maybe mad at me for doing this. But we're so focused on Ukraine and Russia right now. And we're just, I hear the news every day. Oh my gosh, civilians are being killed. And that is tragic. And I am not trying to de demean that in any way. But there's been less than a, a thousand civilians killed while they're bombing over there. Meanwhile, over the last year, the cartels have killed 100,000 people in one year. And the year before that, it was 96,000 people. And this year, I think we're going to hit about 200,000 with fentanyl poisonings. So basically, because they're not bombing us and because it's not a war, these guys don't take it serious. But we're under attack. They are killing Americans it doesn't matter your mechanism of death. You are poisoning and killing Americans every day. And that was my point is like, we're so focused on war and because people make money off of that. But here in our own backyard, we have Americans being killed and we know it's coming from and we're allowing it. Well, look, we wait, we did a 20 year war because they flew a couple planes into um, our, the, our twin tower, I think you know, 3,000, almost 4,000 people. Um, and we went to war for 20 years over that. What are we doing for 100,000 plus Americans that are dying every year? That that number is up. Hey, that's what fentanyl is right now. It is a poisoning. They're, they're looking the, the heroin, the, the marijuana, all of the drugs also have uh, fentanyl in it. And this will be the scourge on the American people. And here's what it is. It's killing civilians. You're focused on those civilians in Ukraine. How, how about you focus on American civilians? Because they're killing civil women, men, teenagers, children. We just arrested a mom the other day whose baby was killed because of the fentanyl poisoning. Grandparents. Nobody is immune. Fentanyl could care less what your economic status is. As a matter of fact, if you think I'm wrong, go and check it out. Black teenagers are the most impacted by this issue, by these issues, the fentanyl issues. So, it, um, and I recognize it as the biggest challenge we're facing as Americans for the loss of life of Americans. And so I challenge all of you to put America first. I said, I don't care about what's going on over there in, the, in, in Russia and Ukraine, but we're losing Amer much more Americans at a much greater rate right here in our own country. But because there aren't bombs being set off, not paying attention to it well and and the fentanyl being the major crisis in this scenario but we also have uh illegals coming across the border in waves austin knutson our attorney general went down there last month uh, after being pushed off four months by the administration not being able to go he finally went and he says that cartel controls every square inch of the border and every person that crosses that border owes the cartel something and to me, that's tragic. No question. Yeah, I tell people all the time, this is not about a Republican, a Democrat, or an independent thing. If you care about human beings, you should absolutely care about what's going on on the border. It's not about immigration anymore. It's about human trafficking and drug trafficking. And the cartel has their hands in everything. They make everybody pay. And they rape the women. 
They use to children as pawns, children who they steal from other country or from other uh, people or purchase at the threat of violence. They extort the men. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. And because of your politics, it aligns with your local uh, ideologies. You're willing to turn a blind to it. Unacceptable. Eight to ten women, they say, are raped. Excuse me, fifty percent of of a tra- gays and transvestites, and I have even heard up to 80% of the children that come across are being raped as well. And so I can't confirm that as last, that last stat, but those are the statistics I hear from Border Patrol and other people in this industry. And uh, we're making the cartel more and more powerful every day because of our failed uh, open border policies here in this country. And if we don't change it, we're in trouble. Just, I'm gonna give you some last quick statistics just to put it into perspective. Last month, we had 163,000 people, plus just a, a little bit over, a little over 163,000 people that were apprehended at the border, okay? We also had 53,000 gotaways, people that we saw on cameras or that ran from us or whatever. And those are the ones we know about, okay? How many of them do you think they actually sent back? Out of 163,000 people that they apprehended, they turned back 11,670 people. Hmm. So less than 10% of the people went, oh, good, we apprehended 163,000 people. No, it's not good because all that release them into the country. And you know when their court dates are? Their court dates are between two and five years from now. Two to five years is when they first have to show up to court. And to have somebody removed, if you talk to ICE, it typically takes at least six to eight years to remove somebody. Now, with the amount of stress that this has put on the, the uh, federal judicial system, I would guess that it, it, it's, it's likely we will not remove these people because of how burdened and bogged down the entire federal court system is. And meanwhile, we continue to put liberal progressive judges and attorneys in who, uh, who create a revolving door and who are providing sanctuary in many cases uh, for these people. Yeah. And also in the meantime, there's some really good people from Mexico that want to come here legally the right way through the system, and they're never going to get here. And those are the kind of people that have value. I'm going to ask one other one other question, and I'm going to tell you it, but I'm going to give a brief story afterwards of mine. And that is, how does everyday middle class, upper class Americans, how are they affected by the border crisis and the fentanyl crisis. Because, you know, we take our kids to school, we come home, we work from the house, we're on Zoom calls, life is good. We don't see it in our own every day. But I know it happens. My wife, and this is my story while you think about your answer, my wife was at Target with my two girls, four and six at the time, in Upland, California, a nice little sleepy, shady town before we moved to Montana. She was followed around that store for 45 minutes by a Hispanic couple. And finally, she realized that they were after her or after our kids, she thought when she actually reviewed the tapes with the security and the local police department, they said, ma'am, they could have taken your kids a dozen times. They were after you. Chances are they wanted to get you and turn you over to the cartel. And both of our hearts just sank like, wow, we had no idea. Right. That's a that's a real life story for us. I'm sure there's plenty like that. Yeah. Unfortunately, most Americans think that this is a an Arizona or a Texas problem or even a California problem. And the fact of the matter is, it is not. We are trying to stop this from coming into your communities. What happens in our backyard today, I promise you, will be in your front yard tomorrow. I was watching a video the other day and they probably had 20 guys walk by as they were filming them, you know, on a camera and they were asking them, where are you going? Um, One said California, two said Florida, Every other person, not a single person said Arizona and not a single person said Texas. We were all planning to go to places like Montana, Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Massachusetts. They were all planning to go inland. The cartel's product is not designed to stay in Arizona or Texas is where they get the least amount of money for their product. This product is designed for your communities. And if you don't think you have cartel in there, you're kidding yourself. If they sell drugs in your community, which I promise you they do, there is a cartel connection in your community. These guys don't just give you the, these street gangbangers uh, product to sell for them and then just say, hey, on good faith, send me the check when you're done. No, they have connections in all of these communities to ensure that their product is delivered, sold, and that they recover the money back after their product has been sold. Um, 90% of all drugs that are in America have come through the southern borders of this country. 
and it is not designed to stay in Arizona or Texas. So all I can tell you is if you think that this is our problem, you are sorely mistaken. We are fighting your problem. We are trying to keep them, these, these humans and these people out of your communities. 